of Gradcast, a podcast and radio show of the Society of Graduate Students at Western University. I'm Elizabeth Muller. I'm your host, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Yusuf Hassan. And today we're very fortunate to have two guests on the show, Shannon Carnahan and Denise Kamuka, both commissioners of the Society of Graduate Students at Western University. Hi, guys. Hello. So maybe first, just to kick us off, we can go, uh, both of you can each spend a little bit of time telling us what a commissioner is and what your specific roles are. Um, hi, I'm Shannon Carnahan. I am the Pride Commissioner uh, for the Society of Graduate Students. This is my first year in the role. Uh, we advocate, or I advocate for uh, people in the LGBTQ community at uh, the uh, council meetings, uh, and I also try to organize uh, social events as much as we can in in the pandemic. That's great. Thank you, Shannon. What about you, Denise? Yeah, much like Shannon, um, as the Racial Equity and Inclusion um, Commissioner, I am in charge of advocating for racialized um, minorities and organizing events for them. Um, I guess really my heart um, in this role that I'm in right now is to try to amplify the voices of um, students at Western that identify as racialized uh, minorities. Awesome. And so recently um, you held an event. Uh, so you, there was a screening of a documentary. I believe it's called The Death and Life of Marsha P. Johnson. So what is that documentary about and how come you chose that as for your screening for songs? So uh, we chose the documentary, The Death and Life of Marsha P. Johnson uh, be for our, our screening for Black History Month because mm -hmm. it is an intersectional uh, film because Marsha P. Johnson was a very significant trans woman of color um, who she's a, a legendary figure in uh, the history of the gay rights movement. Um, she, what she is, the legend has it that she was the one that threw the first shot glass or brick at the Stonewall uprising oh. that next, the next day started the uh, gay rights movement in New York City in the 1960s. Um, and she died under mysterious circumstances in 1992. The documentary follows um, her friend and activist, Victoria Cruz of the Anti-Violence Project as she tries to get uh, Marsha's case reopened and tries to wow. investigate her death. Wow, that's, that's heavy stuff. really, yeah, that must be, that must be pretty heavy as well. Um, so, so I've heard that there was some controversy as well about this documentary. Would you like to talk about that and what your opinion was, either Denise or Shannon? Uh, so there is was a contro is a controversy uh, surrounding the documentary, um, where the uh, filmmaker um, who produced the documentary, David France, was accused of uh, stealing intellectual property from a, another filmmaker who is a trans woman of color, um, who's uh, got her name down here. She, yeah, so she's, uh, so she's, they, she accused this filmmaker, David France, of stealing her intellectual property um, on Instagram. Um, and like she, and there's been a bunch of different posts that have happened since then. Um, we looked in, I, I looked into the allegations of stealing intellectual property and they don't really hold up. Um, they're two very different projects, but they're both focused around Marsha P. Johnson. Um, Gossett, which is the, the name of the trans, last name of the trans woman, uh, her film is called Happy Birthday, Marsha. And it is a partially fictionalized narrative short or scripted film with trans actors. 
And France's film is a documentary that uses archival footage and interviews uh, with people. Uh, they have some, about three scenes in common, but those are all archival footage that's available in multiple places and licensed to, to both creators. Um, little footage exists of Marsha B. Johnson and trans activists from this time. So you're going to see the same archival footage in multiple places if you watch, watch any film about Marsha P. Johnson or trans activists from this time. So uh, the film is criticized for uh, looking at the subjects of color through the white lens or like the, the so the white director or writer writes it or writes and directs it and then the, the people of color are their subjects. So that was our criticism, or it was, was the criticism of the film. Um, we, we wanted to take into account the white lens, uh, but we ran into some problems. Like uh, there are few films written and directed by LGBTQ people of color that we could find on a platform that we had access to at the last minute. Um, so that represents a huge gap uh, in recognition and access to people of color and inter intersecting identities in the film industry. Um, so given that the stealing of intellectual property allegations were unfounded and we didn't have a suitable or alternative film ready, we chose to go ahead with our screening. Um, in the future, we want to try and, and find more um, films or, uh, from, that are written and directed by people of color, but yeah, for the reasons I said, that's why we chose to go ahead with our screening. I, I, I would just like just also to add to, to I guess the criticism uh, of, of um, this white lens and, and maybe even give it a little uh, more validity based on my um, consumption of the, of, the, of the content, right? Um, Definitely, definitely the story needed to be told, I think. And I was, we had mentioned this in our discussion during the movie that I've heard of um, people attributing the initiation or the pioneering of the, um, of LGBT um, rights and the movement to uh, black trans women. But I didn't have a name, I didn't have a figure. There was, I didn't have anything to substantiate what was being said and so, coming across this documentary um, did exactly that. It helped put a name to um, who this woman that people keep alluding to is. Um, but again, when you, when you hear those, when you hear, when you hear people say that they say trans women, black trans women, and this story, this depiction really focused on, as much as it was about the death in life about Marsha, it really focused on, um, from, from my lens, the white perspective. And it, it, it spoke about her in relation to her white counterparts and the white people around her. And so there was that missing element of, so what exactly is the black trans um, contribution to the movement? Um, and, I, and undoubtedly, I believe there is way more than what was shown um, and it is like as Shannon mentioned it's really sad that we did we looked around cr like crazy like reached out to all my film friends I was like come on there has to be something that we can show that is you know directed and written by some by a person of color and that is not it's not out there or it is but they're as, as Shannon mentioned either fictionalized or um, on less known platforms. And so just not easily accessible. And yeah, it's really sad. You know, it's, it's interesting you've mentioned a couple of times uh, the challenges with this film specifically as it was uh, directed and written by um, somebody who was white. And I'm just wondering how you sort of brought that into the discussion because it sounds to me like there was some discussion at the film screening um, that you had on Friday. You know, what were some of the points that were raised in the, in the discussion that you had? Uh, well, as Denise said, um, the film didn't really go into 
um, the experience of, of people of color specifically. Uh, it more focused on um, the trans people uh, trying to cope with uh, the violence that in um, New York City um, and the ongoing violence. It talks uh, you, uh, Sylvia Rivera, who is a close friend of Marsha P. Johnson and, and partnered with her with a lot of their activism. Um, yeah, it, it, they, they talk about all of the violence that they had to survive and literally fighting for their lives um, and their right to exist in New York City. And then it also talked about uh, a current uh, case where another trans woman of color named Islan Nettles was murdered. Um, that's how they open up the film is they got Victoria Cruz and uh, the other anti-violence project people are talking about a case that happened like the night before. And then they talk about the Islan Nettles case. And then you have Victoria Cruz uh, trying, going and interviewing so many different people trying to piece together what happened. So you don't really get much insight into the, the experience of a trans person of color. Mm -hmm. And why do you, why do you, this question is, you know, for either of you, why do you think that that might be that we're not getting that insight. It just speaks to the to the fact that um, <laughs> it speaks to the intersectionality of um, being a black, black and transgender and just how far marginalized um, they are. So they 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 are really literally at the corner 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 of the margins, like, and those voices are hardly ever centered, those voices um, are hardly even acknowledged. Uh, <laughs> I mean, even, in, even in, in, in watching the documentary, it almost felt like Marsha was very mute, like she hardly spoke, she hardly, it, it almost felt that way, um, except when we were watching her sing, which was a great delight. Um, but I think something that was really jarring for me in the, in the in that documentary was how the movement had not really recognized um, the the actions and all the, the efforts of the trans community um, and I guess the black trans community, but that like fully spoke to just a lot of activism that we see now and a lot of advocacy that we still see to this day. Um, be it in like LGBT um, activism, be it in Black Lives Matter activism, be it in um, even the Me Too movement. So where you find Black women are at the were at the forefront helping pioneer these movements, but as the movements get traction and as the movements get publicity, those Black faces, those Black voices, are pushed to the peripherals. And yeah, for me that that just, that comparison for me was so glaring really yeah Shannon yeah uh trans people of color do face that that intersectional it's like the double whammy of being pushed further further into the margins um uh they, they speak about it in the, in the documentary that Marsha was was so about helping other people around her that she did not want to be the center of attention. She, she very much was happy to be uh, to the side of Sylvia Rivera, who, uh, who if, you, if you see photos of them, you'll see Sylvia is always a little to the front and Marsha is, is just trying to be to the side to herself. So uh, to, Marsha was very, very happy to like, she wanted to have her voice, but she did not want to, to jump in. But that kind of speaks to her, her role as they, they called her like the, the trans godmother of the uh, community at that time. Cause she wanted to mother and help everyone that she could. Um, I, I think there might be stuff to like in, investigate a little more there um, in terms of um, what the experience of 
um, people of color or black people leading movements like this, mm -hmm. where for visibility, for um, progression, for they need to take that step back and allow um, white faces to lead so that there is that, so we get the publicity, so we get that focus on, on what's going on. I'm not saying that is just exactly what happened here, but I definitely believe that there's something to investigate in that. Oh yeah, uh, there's a trying to act, like it's a way to access the privilege that the white people have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that you can kind of get up on it in your own way. Um, and speaking back to um, another point that was, was raised about trans people and trans people of and people of color in the LGBT community um, having to deal with kind of inner subculture uh, conflicts. Um, they talk about in 1973, Johnson, Johnson and Rivera were banned from participating in the pride parade because the other marchers felt that the, the transvestites were, and the drag queens were giving them a bad name. Um, so Johnson and Rivera, uh, would not stand for this and ended up marching ahead of the parade to try and like reclaim their, their, their space. So, and there, there are other inner subculture conflicts or that happen or, or the different subgroups within the culture don't always interact nicely with each other. Um, I remember in my gender studies class, I read an article about, uh, the black and Hispanic lesbian community in New York City um, throughout the, the 70s, 80s and 90s was almost an entirely separate entity from the main, from the other uh, gay subculture there. Um, they had their, their own bars where they would, or the drag kings would go um, and it was also racialized. So there wasn't a whole lot of mixing between the Caucasians and the people of color um, and then they also mentioned right at the top of the documentary that uh, the Stonewall Inn used to be a men only bar and they wouldn't let the trans people in or any women in. And they like it was the week before the Stonewall uprising that they let the trans people in. So, uh, and I, I can even talk about anecdotes from my own experience where there's uh, the gay men kind of rule everything and the female identified or the trans identified have to like deal with not having very many resources or having the men run everything their way. It sounds to me like it's one of those, um, you know, issues around intersectionality and even within groups, um, you know, marginalized communities, there's still a struggle for power and a struggle to have mm -hmm. voices heard that are, you know, typically pushed to the to the margins. Definitely. Oh yeah. Every, everyone's struggling for for recognition or to to get uh, their activism in in the in the forefront. Right. There's a line that Sylvia said in the documentary, which was, oh, it just really pulled at my heartstrings. Um, <laughs> to the point where I'm like, yeah, okay. But um, it, she said, she was describing um, just their life pre-Stonewall and how she described it as unreal. You know, the idea that you never know when you're going to get arrested, people are um, treating you like subhuman. And, and for me to think of that as somebody's reality, as in like literally waking up every morning and having to pinch yourself like, this is my reality. That just broke my heart. And I think that really uh, just really speaks to the need for centering those experiences. Um, so there's a um, post-colonial ther um, like theorist or academic <laughs> um, called Spivak, and she really speaks about how it's, it's really important for us to 
try to get the lived experience of the most marginalized because that's the most inclusive experience. That's the most, that's where we'll find the most inclusive solutions and, you know, and answers. Um, and yeah, just hearing that, I, I knew that I can't even tap into what she was, I, I can't even imagine what she was going through. It, yeah, it's, this movie gives you all of the feels. Yeah. Like, I, I'm not a very, I don't cry easily at films. And I was tearing up at multiple points throughout this film. Like, yeah. it, it really makes you feel your feelings. Um, and uh, watching Sylvia Rivera in this film, who is Marsha's best friend, um, you get to see an incredibly resilient person with the sheer things that she survived. Uh, and there's one point I wanted to, to bring up from my notes. Um, the trans woman of color filmmaker Gossett, um, in her Instagram post, she speaks about a frustration with um, struggling to pay rent um, as, and uh, that's, that's how uh, employment discrimination and housing for trans people is, is a big issue. Um, and Marsha and her friend Sylvia Rivera founded Star House in the 1970s, which is a shelter for gay and trans street kids. And they paid the rent for it with money they made as sex workers. Um, and they, Johnson and Sylvia worked to provide a sense of family for gay street kids. Uh, and the film shows that after Marsha's death, Sylvia struggled with alcoholism and homelessness and she recovered and continued her activism by working to provide ba like bag lunches to those in need, like right up until her death in 2003. So this film shows the remarkable resilience of the community. Thank and, you. you know, you've mentioned that this film uh, was set in this sort of 60s, 70s time period. Just based on, on your lived and professional experience, would you say that that housing is still a challenge for um, trans people of color today? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm from Saskatoon. And for the past couple of decades, they, they've uh, been struggling to struggled to open uh an assisted housing project for uh, LGBT kids. And they finally did open it. It's called Pride Home. It took forever to get it opened. Um, and employment discrimination, especially, and housing is big problems for, for trans people. So <clears throat> thank you. And so Johnson's drag queen name was Marsha P. Johnson. I believe there's some sort of uh, story about what P stands for. Are you familiar with this? So it's apparently pay it no mind. Right, they talk about that. She talks and, about that in the film. Yeah, would you like to talk about it as well? What does pay it no mind mean? And why was it important for her to have Marsha P. Johnson as her drag queen name? Yeah, so she chose like the P for pay it no mind because she's like, I oh, just don't worry about it. That's kind of, it was kind of like her life philosophy is like, just don't let it bother you. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you watched the, you watched the documentary. You yeah, I was there it. with you. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think? What did you think of the, like the, putting the P in her name? I, I wasn't sure it was enough that I was like, I'm going to ask you this question <laughs> and test you what you think. But I had another question. I know we're running a bit out of time as well, which was about her dad since the documentary was about the death and life of Marsha P. Johnson. And you did mention earlier on that it was somewhat mysterious. And another aspect of her death was what did the cops do <laughs> in terms of investigation? Would you like to chat about that? Maybe let's begin with Denise first. Well, yeah, you can tell throughout the documentary that there is a lot of speculation of foul play and conspiracy and um, uh, connections with the mob um, and corrupt police. And so you can tell that there, um, 
actually you walk away <laughs> from that documentary um, with the notion that justice was not done and that um, mm -hmm. yeah all that could have been done to solve this case was not and that yeah. there's a lot more at play in terms of um, who had to gain from Marsha Marsha's story not you know seeing the daylight or her case not being solved yeah yeah and the efforts made to just investigate what happened were really frustrating to watch and it reminds us of the some of the nonsense that we experience even now uh that was a lot more prevalent i guess then um uh, yeah. I guess, yeah, um, Shana, can i just say something as well yeah marcia's death was instantly ruled a suicide with absolutely no real investigation into it she was found in the hudson river with a head injury on the back of her head uh, and it was ruled a suicide and everyone was like, Marsha was full of life. This does not make any sense. She would not have killed herself. Um, and then as it, they go into the documentary, Marsha's roommate was in, um, challenging uh, the committee running the Christopher Street Festival and Pride Parade. Um, Cause it was rumored that the mafia was embezzling the community funds that were meant to, to put on this uh, street festival and the pride parade and none of the money was actually going back into the community. Um, and embezzling charity funds is an incredibly common uh, organized crime practice. Uh, you can find lots of different charities and at this time, New York City was essentially run by the mafia. They had corrupt police officers. Uh, so uh, it's rumored that to, to stop her roommate from in investigating this embezzlement, that they, they killed Marsha to, to send a message to back off. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we could talk a lot more about that as well, but we are at the end of this podcast. And... So uh, is just as we end, um, is there any social media outlet that you want to share with the audience, your contact or anything? First, uh, Denise? Or... Yeah, sure. Um, well, you can definitely reach me um, at um, racial.equity at socks.ca. Um, if you have any concerns, anything you just want to reach out about, find out any resources that are available for um, racialized minorities um, at Western. And you can also check out our um, SOGS advocacy page on Facebook, where we post most of the events that um, we have going on. So actually, in, during this Black History Month, we have a few um, events happening. Uh, just give a quick shout out or quick plug. Um, on the 18th, we have a um, program called Living in the Margins, which is something that we want to continue going on through this year, um, looking at different um, um, areas of advocacy. But this, this event is with a psychologist that um, focuses or specializes in racial trauma. Her name is Lumina Morris. And so she's just gonna be fielding questions from um, Western um, students that have just submitted questions or experiences and trying to just give tools for how to navigate uh, racial trauma. And then on the 25th, we have a public lecture with Nicole Kanicki, um, which is going to be amazing. Um, just looking at racial inequality um, and EDI in the academic space. And then lastly, um, on the 25th as well, we have a book club where we're reading a book that I absolutely love called Nervous Conditions, mm -hmm. um, which looks at the colonial mindset or colonizing of the mind um, experienced by uh, women of color that come from those colonial legacies. So, wow. Yeah. A lot is happening. Us? Shannon? Uh, I can be reached at pride at sogs.ca. I'm also fairly active on the Sogs Discord server. Uh, you can also find me in information on how to contact me through Googling um, Pride Commissioner at Western. Great, thank you. Well, you've been listening to GradCast. 
the podcast and radio show, The Society of Graduate Students at Western University. I've been your host today, Elizabeth Moeller, along with my co-host, Yusuf Hassan. The episode was produced today by Ariel Frame, and we were fortunate enough to have two guests today, the Racial and Equity Commissioner, Denise Kamuka, as well as Shannon Carnahan, the Pride Commissioner. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at gradcastradio at gmail.com. You can find us at Gradcast Radio on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening and have a good night.